one to sit around and fishing field team c-o-a-f field team on youtube and this round we're answering the mail <clears throat> specifically I had a question come in from our live stream yesterday and specifically asking about some fishing flies so let's see what the what that specific question was let's see it's from loyalist 1407 and the comment is could you do a show on dry flies or flies in general thanks all the best from scotland all right i, I like this one and um, i'm going to take an average joe perspective and just describe uh, how I answer the mail and what I do from a fishing fly standpoint. So I'm going to be thinking from an average Joe standpoint that I'm just maybe new to an area or I just want to um, figure out, well, um, things about fishing flies because I'm just getting started. So let's uh, let's keep it as simple here and let's take you to Google and we'll just do a simple uh, search on types of fishing flies. And in here, it looks like, <coughs> excuse me, it looks like the first entry comes in. Again, it's one of those uh, sponsored ones. So I looked at it and um, it's good info, but I really like the next one right here. Types of fishing flies, your beginner's guide, and it comes from the hikingandfishing.com blog. And so I took a look at that one and this one got me really excited because it had some great information and I'm showing it right over here types of fishing flies by Max Dis Dismaris uh, and it's got article with categories of fishing and fishing tips and specific article tags that talk of fishing gear fishing tips and fly fishing and I took a look at it and what I really liked about it was the detail that it provided specifically on Right here, major categories flies. He kept it simple and, and gave a category of flies and then went into more detail for each one. So <clears throat> types of fishing flies, you've got two kinds. You got a wet fly and a dry fly. Wet fly being in this case ones that is fished below the surface, and a dry fly that is fished above the surface. Pretty straightforward. So he goes into more detail there. Uh he actually even gives another link and i'll put these in the comments as well as the description of the uh of this video <coughs> excuse me and he breaks out into more details about wet flies and dry flies and everything you need to know and uh, he, he did a, a really good job on on providing uh, details on fishing flies um some categories some subcategories how you would use them and some thoughts on what they mimic and I can I can run through them just to go over some key points that I, I really liked out of both both the articles, and then uh, we can expand more. Uh, hopefully, answering the mail about um, well fishing flies. Okay, so let's go back to the first article. And in this case, he's talking of wet flies, fishing them below the surface, and then the next thing is dry flies above the surface, and then. This was good about the study of insects and entomology and what they're mimicking. Here's what uh, I really liked was a straightforward explanation on each of the different fish and flies and what they're mimicking. So in the case of midges, let's see if I can get this right here. In the case of midges, I always wonder what a zebra midge was, was mimicking. And uh, guess what? It looks like it's this kind of little midge insect and whatnot. And it talks of the different uh, different stages. So you've got the larva, you got the emerger, and then you've got the adult. And right here, I've used this type of fly before, and it looks like that larva midge. And then from an emerger where it's hatched out of its larval stage and it's getting ready to emerge, I've used this one also. It's kind of um like a zebra midge, but it also has um some kind of cdc feather on there that's that's gonna help it float higher in the <laughs> in the water column if not right under the surface breaking the surface like it's showing in the picture uh so uh that was some good information there and again this is um from the hikingandfishing.com types of fishing flies uh article uh in the case of mayflies you know you, you see these flying everywhere and whatnot and uh, and then you, you, you take your net and you put it through the water or scene and you see these different things in the water. 
I never understood where it's really what it's really mimicking. And uh, taking a look at this particular article, um, I, I did like it. it. It gave some really good insight. So here's here's the case of a larva mayfly, and that looks really close to a pheasant tail uh, nymph. Use that many times on the blue as well as various rivers in our area. And then this looks like another emerger pattern, a sulfur CDC. Uh, again, one that's just breaking off the surface. And then here's the adult sitting on the surface. So this is probably going to be like a dry fly in case, uh, like a Cahill possibly. And then here's a spinner where it's 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 done mating and now it's hit the water and it's just waiting there to um, die or has already died and the fish, <coughs> excuse me, and the fish are going to take it. And so here's this pattern where you can see where it has the wings splayed out. And there it is where it's in real life sitting on the water. So uh, that was good information. Uh, he also goes on to, let's see, in the case of a caddis. So I've, I've used these, these patterns before for fishing, just really never, never used um, or understood what, the, what they were really mimicking. And so here, here it is right here. Uh, so <clears throat> I highly recommend if you want to learn more about, <coughs> excuse me, fishing flies, go check out this uh, blog. Uh, in this article and again i'll put it in the comments i'll put it in the description so you can have easy access uh but uh, do take away from this that it's it's giving you some good insight so when you are on the river and you see this particular let's say this this guy right here right there in your scene or even this one you know that you probably want to use something in this pattern and from an emerger here's another one where you've got some cdc lifting off the Looks like the, the head portion from an emerger. And then this one, classic uh, uh, Cahill, elk hair caddis pattern that uh, you're mimicking. Again, this caddis sitting on the surface. All right. So uh, really like this article. Let's go. <coughs> There's the stonefly. Talking of terrestrials. Terrestrials. So you've got the ant, the grasshopper, beetle. See if I can get this better. And of these, I've used the ant, the grasshopper, the beetle, uh, dragonfly, uh, a version of a moth, a version of a deer fly, not the salmon fly or the cicada. Uh, but in all cases, I've used them in our local ponds and had no issues uh, fishing them. <clears throat> in this case, these are fish mainly dry, uh, right on the surface. And let's see, there's another one the scuds and sow bugs so I, I i've been using this pattern right here the rainbow warrior midge but i never understood it was the sow bug it looks like one of those little um we call them potato bugs you always see them out uh, in the lawns and whatnot eating on junk uh here's a scud right here and and there's what it's being mimicked by with this pattern here or here <coughs> and then Getting into more detail, annelids or worms. Uh, I've used a San Juan worm over the years, a leech pattern, yes, especially with bass. Uh, San Juan worm uh, for for trout, uh, sometimes using it as a, a trailing fly. And then in the case of one variant of a San Juan I, a worm, I make a San Juan worm ball where it's like four or five pieces of chenille. And it looks like a ball of worms uh, just kind of moving through the water and um kind of bounce along the bottom and i've caught catfish as well as bass with it uh, so uh, that's a, a good one to keep in your back pocket from a fishing fly standpoint and then there's damsel flies and uh dragonflies right there and have used those as well now shifting over to the wet flies let's <coughs> take, excuse me take a look what he has here he's got nymphs uh he's got emergers and and then a streamer this one kind of kind of i was wondering okay well it's a wet fly a streamer but it's it's not really a nymph and what it um at least what i understood and what's being confirmed here in the uh article is uh streamer is larger than your than your nymph fly and it's usually mimicking or simulating bait fish and so your your woolly buggers, your your uh, what is it, lefty deceivers, and your clouser minnows, those are variations of streamers. 
Um, so then there's other fly types. Poppers use those a lot. Uh, saltwater flies in particular. Again, <clears throat> you've got your lefty deceiver. You've got your clouser minnows uh, that are used as well as... There's one that I used when I was back in um, Rhode Island as well as in Virginia. Uh, fishing for striped bass. I recall the silver side little fish that have the little silver side. Use those. Um, and in this case... Uh, a more specialized one where it's mimicking, <coughs> excuse me, a crab. So uh, those are all different fishing flies. And those are all ones that you want to keep in your back pocket. And it goes on further about which fly type to use. And I, I liked how uh, he describes this. Uh, some good detail there, be it uh, you're a beginner or a novice or an expert. Uh, which fly type you use, just kind of keeping it simple. That's a good read. Uh, where to buy your flies, you can buy them, uh, suggestions there, as well as um, if you're going to take up fly tying. And this one I, I, I did like. Uh, the patterns that he's suggesting for a beginner um, made sense to me. Uh, the first one being the woolly bugger, okay, right here. The next one, an elk hair caddis. So the woolly bugger being more like a, a streamer, uh, Mimic bait fish could mimic all kinds of different things in the water and everything seems to, to want to eat it Elk hair cat is something that keeps on the surface could be those bugs and whatnot On them line. Uh, I've done really well with the elk hair cat is The hare's ear nymph this one. I, I That's one of the the first ones. I also learned to tie from a nymph standpoint and uh, That that has been a producer of trout as well as various you know pond fishing in warm water for bluegill bass or bluegill and panfish and whatnot, uh, that's been a really good one. The zebra midge, that one seems to work better for me on for trout, and <clears throat> it's a very simple tie. And with those four flies, uh, I think that's your your starter for any body of water that you're going to uh, potentially uh, hit. Let's see, I think I got a comment. Oh, there we go. It looks like Eric's on. Hey, Eric, how's it going? See if I can uh, get it up here so I can see the comment. Still learning this uh, software here. <laughs> I vote for return of the near deer giveaway contest. Oh yeah, yeah, I was doing those, but uh, it, it turns out technically those giveaways are um, they're like raffles, so they they come under some kind of rule. So I quit doing those because of that. Um, but those were fun. The near deer is very good. Good um, fly. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Uh, let, me, let me go back up again for those that want to get started fly fishing and the recommendation or fly tying and the re recommendation of um, what to use and what was being suggested. Uh, the woolly bugger, yes, uh, do agree, as well as it's a good one to learn the basics of fly tying on. Elk hair caddis, that's another good one. It does get a little tricky because it has deer hair that you're going to have to spin um, and build up the head. Uh, but that's a good one to practice on. And it's very forgiving. It doesn't have to be perfect. And as long as it's floating on the surface and kind of gives that simulation of a uh, bait fish on the water or a bug on the water, you're going to get hits. The hair's your nymph. This one, again, is another one that's forgiving. It does give some basics in fly tying in building up the body, uh, the dubbing, and, and wrapping it with the gold ribbing. Uh, so a lot of good stuff there with the hairs of your nip. Plus, it does work well. And for us in our area, at least rumor has it that the gold rib hairs ear nymph looks very similar to some of the trout nuggets that's being fed to your stock trout at the fisheries. So you take a look at a hair's ear nymph, you take a look at one of these little nuggets and whatnot that they're feeding, <coughs> it, it, they kind of look similar. So maybe that's another reason why they, they at least from a stocking, stock trout standpoint, um, get a lot of um, good stuff there, or at least uh, trout bites. Let's see, I'm trying to adjust this uh, window here real quick. Okay, and then um, in the case of the zebra midge, that's a very simple tie. And what it does is it, it teaches you to build up a thread body so it tapers 
in the shape of that midge and then you add that ribbing to it so it's another practice of adding a ribbing to uh, a fish and fly and then at the same time uh, you're using a bead head <clears throat> applying a coating of lacquer or whatnot on it and uh, it's it's one of those ones that uh, some days that's all they want is that zebra midge or that midge larval staged uh, insect to mimic so uh, that's, a, that's a good one to keep in your back pocket in fact let's uh let's go and show you specifically because it just says things here but let's go to let's go back to google all right and i want to show you in the case of the woolly bugger this is what he's suggesting as a first one to learn how to tie this guy right here a woolly bugger you got different colored ones and whatnot okay the elk hair caddis so let's go put that in and this is going to be a dry fly and it looks like that right there all right you got different shapes and whatnot and again like i was saying this one this one's going to take a little bit of learning but it's a good one to learn the tie because you do spin the, the deer hair to build up that head and at the same time uh, you're building up and and kind of um, learning to tie on the different pieces of material I think it starts out with some kind of mylar uh, base and then after that uh, it, it builds up the body and I think there's some some wings or at least pheasant tail I think is what it is uh, some kind of pheasant tail feather, I think, is also added in some cases. That'll that that'll uh, be along the body, and then you'll build up the hair. So that's like three, four different ties, and it's 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 teaching you how to to use some techniques that you're going to use for other fishing flies. So uh, I agree that's that's another good one to have. Uh, the other one he mentioned was the gold rib hairs ear nymph. That one looks like this, and for short, some folks will call it the G-R-E-H-N, Gold Ribbed Hairs Ear Nymph. All right, and there it is right there. And like I was saying, uh, if you look at maybe some, some uh, foods that are eaten by, uh, well, here, let's just take a real quick look. I think it's called Purina Trout Chow. Let's see what that looks like. Uh, it looks like little pellets here. More pellets, more pellets. Yeah, it looks like pellets. So maybe it's got the same color pellet look, and that's why it's uh why they like hitting it. Oh, well, it's good to know. And then uh, the last one that's suggested is a basic one to learn, and that I agree that uh, will probably work in a lot of places to fish uh, in our area is the zebra midge. Okay, and you can see there's different color ones here. Let me see if I can get a better view of it. Different colors right here. What I notice on the Blue River is the, the red and the blue. And then sometimes white seems to be good to have. Um, but typically, I'll have the blue and the red ready to go. All right. All right. So let's go back to the article. Let's see. He also talks of what is the best fly. And this is going to be a tough one. Uh, it gives different um, scenarios and whatnot to think about. And what I find, what is the best fly, it's going to depend on the area that you're fishing and what you're actually uh, attempting to catch and over the years uh, I've noticed there are certain ones that seem to work for us uh, better than others uh, in the case of the blue what I typically would keep on me for the three suggested flies I think I wrote this way back when somewhere um, I suggested the near deer or a woolly bugger along with the gold rib hairs ear nymph and then the zebra midge, be it in black and red. And uh, that seemed to work well for us. Um, I do have an article that I like um, 
and I'll explain how I got to it uh, so that when you're attempting to see what will work for your area, um, you know, just do a quick search, be it on Google, uh, fishing forums, or your local fly shop and ask them what works and what they suggest. And most likely they've probably fished that area uh, many years. So they have a really good understanding as to what to uh, use for your particular area. So what is the best fly? It's going to depend on the area you're fishing and what, what you're fishing for. In the case of, let's say in general, if I was going to go out and go do some fishing at the local ponds that I have here for bass and bluegill, um, you know, I've, I've got a set of flies that I keep in my back pocket all the time uh, or in my fly box all the time. And then uh, if I'm fishing various rivers and whatnot, or if I'm going to the local tail race, uh, I'll have some set of flies there as well. But uh, let's see. Well, here, let me show you some of the the flies that uh, I've used in our area and maybe that'll pique the interest of others and then I'll, I want to talk about like an average Joe standpoint of how I would determine for a given situation where to fish um, over the years I fished uh, west coast east coast overseas um, and then mm, over the past uh, years I've been mainly in Texas now uh, but even there, even places that I've been to, I tend to follow the same uh, suggestions. I go to the locals and I take a look at what's working and, well, match the pattern. <laughs> okay, so um, of the ones that I uh, tend to use, um, I'll just go through a, it's a playlist that I put together way back when. I got this fly tying peak vice that uh, uh, I got... That's the last one that I have bought fly tying wise and I've kept over the years and it's been a really good vice for me uh, for tying flies and these are ones that I put in this playlist. All right. So the first one is this the foam grasshopper. It's beaver tail variant. So it uses this um, uh, like a, a cutter that you can uh, use for closed cell foam to form that body. In this case, it's a beaver tail body. And so I was using that for fishing for bass and it was mainly just to build a bigger foam grasshopper because I knew the, the bigger bass or at least the bass wanted something bigger than, than what I anticipated. The uh, tying the bass on bed fishing fly. What happened here was during the uh, spawn in our local ponds and lakes and whatnot, uh, the bass will go on their beds and really what you're looking for is a, a pattern that, that is big, visible, and that you can drag across the, the bed in front of that bass's mouth or eyes and trigger a strike. And what that bass on bed fly does is it, it, it drags along the bottom, hook bend up, and then the head has a high visible off color color it may be pink it may be orange but it'll be an off color that uh is very vi that's visible so that you can see it as you're dragging across the bed uh when you see that color disappear you know to go ahead and set the hook uh elk hair caddis this was a quick tie one that i i had done uh, and like i was saying and like it was uh, described that uh, that's one of the a good one to learn uh from a beginner standpoint uh, there's another one talking the help air caddis again. So I've got two of them up there. The uh, Tinkara fly, or correction, let's go back up here. The foam spider, or AKA brim getter. So I, I got a kit from Wapsi and came with a bunch of these foam bodies that was pretty much like the Betts brim getter fly. And what this does is it allows you to fish dry and it usually works really well on spawning bluegill and bass uh, and trigger those strikes and whatnot. So uh, instead of buying them, I use this kit and I still have some more of those as well available. The Craft Fur Clouser Minnow. That one is a, is a local variant of a Clouser Minnow, but it, instead of using deer hair, it's using Craft Fur. And I'm using it mainly to target the striped bass over there up at Denison Dam, the tail race at Lake Texoma. And that's been a, a producer over the years. Sometimes they want the craft fur. Sometimes they want the traditional one with the deer hair. In other cases, um, they want something else. 
Next one is a simple Tinkara fly, and it doesn't mean you, you have to use it for Tinkara fishing. Uh, I've used it for just traditional fly fishing as well. Um, but think of this one as uh, a fly, a specialized fly that is reverse hackled so that the feathers kind of pulse when you when you when you're takara fishing you tend to do this little twitchy movement with your rod and it pulses and that that makes it look alive the sabiki fly um this one was just uh um i i wanted a cheaper method to catch a bunch of white bass and and yellow bass at the local lake and i was using Doritos bags as well as Frito Lays, and I think there was one was like like a breakfast cookie um, bag that's got this kind of mylar wrapping, and I was using that to make that fly, and um, I don't know, it just turned out pretty good. <laughs> the the purple marabou and orange thing, the Piedmont, that's another variation of the bass on bed fly, and again, it's rides hook bent up, it's got the feathers that are highly visible with that orange piece. And again, I'm, I'm, it's a specialized one that I was using to target those, those, be, those be, uh, bass on beds. And so uh, take a look at these in general. Um, I tend to go back to, here's the olive near deer. Uh, you can tie it in various colors and whatnot, but I tend to go back to this near deer. It's, it's been a, a go-to one over the years. We learned it from uh, a local fishing guide, Carrie Thorne. Uh, who uh, guides here at the local lake, Lake Laban, as well as up at Beaver's Bend and uh, various places here in the Metroplex as well, uh, as well as in Oklahoma. And this has been uh, a game changer for yours truly when it comes to trout fishing. Use it both on uh, the Blue River, the Little Illinois River, or the Lower Illinois, as well as the Lower Mountain Fork up in Oklahoma, down on the Guadalupe, as well as the local ponds that we have here when they're, they're stocking trout. And year in, year out, this tends to, to catch a fish or two. <laughs> uh, more on the foam grasshopper, the KDM Crystal Dub Minnow. Uh, this is one that I I went fishing at Denison Dam, our local tail race to Lake Texoma for striped bass, and I noticed uh, there were a bunch of fishermen, fly fishermen, who were just tearing up the fish, and uh, I didn't know what pattern they were using. Uh, but I noticed that someone had posted something, I think it was on Facebook or one of the fishing forums, oh, this is the fly that worked, but there was no name for it. And I took that picture and I said, here, I think it looks like this, or it 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 it, it is tied like this. And I tied it, and now I keep that in my back pocket uh, for be it fishing for Denison Dam, as well as when I'm fishing... Uh, the local lake, uh, Lake Levant for white bass. In fact, I've used it when I went um, uh, kayak fishing. Uh, that was one of the uh, fishing flies that worked well for me. All right, another foam grasshopper variant, the damsel fly, more on the deer deer, a mop fly, the rainbow warrior midge. That's a good one to have right here. I think I just posted a, another quick tie video on it. And then right here, the Noah Hurl Griffiths gnat. This is a case where I really wanted a fishing fly that I could tie quickly, and in this case, a griffin that is already uh, a simple pattern that uses peacock curl as well as uh, your, your tying thread and then some grizzly hackle. Uh, in this case, I believe I just went with the grizzly hackle and uh, the tying thread and just said skip the hurl and see if we'll still, still catch some fish. Um, let's see, one of three suggested fishing flies for trout. This is one um, where I'm going into detail as to those three uh, suggested flies. In this case, it was the gold rib hair's ear nymph. And then another specialized one, the do-it-yourself tube popper fly. So this is one that um, I used mainly to target bass in the local ponds. And what it does is it takes uh, a balsa head and you put a tube through it and then... You tie your feathers and whatnot onto that tube, and then you run a line through the tube, and then you attach a hook. And so the hook is actually separate from the body itself of the fishing fly. And then uh, uh, you just kind of fish it uh, like normal, 
and then when they does does get a strike that hook just runs free and the the or the the hook stays with the fish and the rest of it kind of uh runs free up and down the line so you, you know, there's less of a chance technically of losing the fish but uh i i tend to just use it on a whim typically uh usually at a couple of local ponds because there's some good bass there that tend to like that one uh the guadalupe anna is one that i picked up from one of the local folks over there in the guadalupe river fishing down at new Braunfels area for trout and one of the suggestions was to use this guadalupe anna uh, but it was in a larger size and it was targeting the um guadalupe bass excuse me I'm gonna take a drink real quick and it was targeting the Guadalupe bass on the Guadalupe River down there in South Texas. And uh, what I did was I just tied it on a smaller size hook, used less marabou, but pretty much followed the same pattern. And I used that for trout, both, <coughs> excuse me, both on the Guadalupe as well as on local ponds. And then guess what? It does work for, for local local bass, or local ponds and the bass here up in the dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, let's see, this is one that I... Put in the playlist because they were talking about large feathers on small saw tackles that was a good one uh let's see denison dam dauber yeah that's another one that's uh used up in uh this and dam for striped bass and then some suggestions on the others and then this is a specialty one that i picked up uh it, it supposedly is the the start or the beginning of the deer deer in this case it was the john deer and it kind of it's called the john deer because it's got a green colored john deer tractor color for the head and then uh it has yellow eyes so it has that pattern uh, of a tractor of a john deer tractor and then it uses a chenille for the body and then just a touch of, of marabou on the on the end right by the hook bend and this one's typically fished, um, I think it was Bennett Springs up in Missouri is where they, they had used this a lot. And it's been a fish getter up there. Uh, yours truly used it down here. And what I noticed is it tends to work, at least for me, on the local ponds when it's really cold. And there's very movement, very little movement on the uh, uh, fly being, on the fly while you're fishing it. And that seems to work well. Let's see. Uh, Again, you can see a pattern here. I'm using the near deer. I'm talking the mop flies where it's just a simple um, um, node from a, a mop and you're building this fly and the trout are liking it, uh, at least uh, in our area. And then right at that tail end, I think I talk about how we got started fly time because it was another question I got hit up with about um, uh, you know, what, what fly tying equipment should I get and how should I get started. So I can, I can show that one later um so those are some suggestions from a fish and fly standpoint uh again just to reiterate at the beginning we talked of the article from let's see if i can grab it real quick from the hiking and fishing dot com site and it's called types of fly fishing flies and in there, there's some really good information. And again, I'll put a, a link in the uh, description and comments of this video. Uh, take a look at that. And then it also breaks out to um, <clears throat> differences between the wet flies versus dry flies and what you need to know, again, by the same author. Uh, and I'll put another link there so you can take a look at it there. So if you really want to learn about fishing flies in general, uh, I highly recommend it. How I found it. Uh, just went on Google and went and typed types of fishing flies. Oops, a little too fast. Types of fishing flies. The first uh, hit is a sponsored one. So kind of scroll down there. And right there, types of fishing flies, your beginner's guide, hikingandfishing.com. There's some other ones here to take a look at. And speaking of other ones, so let's say you want to know what fishing fly to use for your particular area that you're going to fish. Well, uh, 
you can do again the Google search. You can go talk with some local experts, talk to the um, some other folks at a other fishermen who fished a particular area. Ask that question and see if you get some answers and maybe get at least a, a understanding as to what at least to start with. Um, and like in the article um, that was just mentioned, it was suggesting four basic fishing flies to start with if you're going to learn to fly tie. Well, those same four fishing flies that you want to start learning to fly tie, I think those are a good base one that if you're going to be fishing at least here in the U.S. and for trout and whatnot, uh, I would recommend it. Uh, and it recommended the woolly bugger. It recommended the elk hair caddis. And then it recommended the gold rib hair's ear nymph. And then finally the zebra midge. And I think with those four flies as your basis in your fly box, I think you should be able to catch fish in your area uh, at least from a freshwater standpoint. Saltwater, well, we're going to have to spin that one a little bit. All right. So uh, types of fishing flies, uh, that's how I got to that article. Uh, looking at uh, what to use. So let's just say um, suggested fishing flies. And since we're, let's say we're going to go fish Oklahoma. In fact, I'm going to try fishing uh, the Blue River this weekend. But let's say I'm a newbie, and I'll just say suggested fishing flies for Oklahoma. Oklahoma. And let's see where it takes us. Okay, so here's some suggestions here that's coming from Oklahoma fly fishing. And then right here, and I saw this article years back, and I stick with this one. This, this is a very good one. Six fishing flies for every Oklahoma fly angler should carry. And guess what? It has uh, some good insight. And these flies that he's uh, suggesting are ones that have worked uh, over the years, uh, at least fishing for trout uh, in the Oklahoma area. So right here, this first one, the woolly bugger. <laughs> guess what? That's one to learn to tie at first. Uh, in there, I don't see the gold rib hairs here in it, but there's the zebra midge. Okay. There's a San Juan worm, very simple tie. That's that's a very simple tie if you want to learn how to uh, or get started fly tying. It doesn't hurt to learn that one as well. This is a pheasant tail nymph, and this is I think it's a parachute parachute Adams, and then this is a soft hackle. In this case, it's an olive soft hackle. Um, I I think the gold rib hair is your nymph if you if you tie it with the soft hackle i think it would um also apply in this case so uh there's a good starting point if you're going to be fishing oklahoma have these ready to go and then let's say i'm back here in texas suggested fishing thighs for let's just narrow it down to uh fresh water fish and then let's just say texas and let's see what that tells us Basic flies for our waters, Texas women fly fishers. Okay, and then let's see, what else does it show? Texas freshwater fly fishing. Okay, best fly fishing flies, Texas fly fishing. So a lot of good information here. Here's basic fly fishing from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, but let's go look at this first one from the Texas women fly fishers. See what that tells us. Okay, it's going to be tough to see this, but let's see. I got to open it up a little bit here, but um, I'm just flipping through it real quick. It's it's talking of trout and different nymphs and whatnot. Uh, talking about sunfish, the cichlids, uh, largemouth bass. So that's another good one, I, I would say, to at least start with. And you wouldn't go wrong with starting out with those basic patterns, uh, at least for our area here in Texas. All right. Now, the other thing is, let's go salt water. Suggested fishing flies for salt water. And we'll just do a general one. And let's see if it falls in line with some of the stuff that uh, I've done uh, fishing in different places. Seven all-around best saltwater flies. Okay. There's the lefties deceiver, the clouser minnow, the woolly bugger, crab fly, gurgler, sea doozer, and the marabou muddler. All right. Okay. That's probably good. Of these, I've used 
the Lefty Deceiver, fishing for striped bass. Uh, let's see, Virginia, Elizabeth River, as well as off the coast of um, uh, North Carolina, as well as up in uh, Rhode Island area, as well as the Outer Banks, North Carolina. Uh, that's worked well. Uh, I think it, it works more when they're when the bass are on top because uh, it, it's not really weighted too much. Well, it's not really weighted at all. Um, the Glauser minnow, uh, that's done well, especially when I'm fishing for them when they're further down. And guess what? I've used both of these as well, the Lefty Deceiver as well as the Clouser minnow. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> fishing for striped bass over here at Denison Dam, again at that local tail race of ours for the Lake Texoma. Alrighty. Let me fix something again real quick here. So, fishing flies in general, uh, I would do so. Take a look online. Start there because it's readily available to, for, for a majority of us. And then from there, narrow it down to be it uh, uh, fishing groups in your area. To what features should a beginner fly tar do for buying a fly tar device? All right. It's a good one. Well, shoot. Let's go run over to this one where um, I got asked a question years ago about getting started in fly tying right here. How we got started in fly tying. And the big takeaway from here is uh, from a fly tying by standpoint, well, I explained it in the video, um, but uh, I'll, I'll write it here in a moment. Um, I, th I think you'll, you'll, you'll ask the question and you'll get a ton of answers and they're all telling you to, to typically buy something that's really, really expensive. Um, in this video, uh, I'm explaining how I got started. And uh, I got started with like a $10, $9.99 from Bass Pro, I think it was. Um, and then I just kind of slowly upgraded till I finally settled on the, the peak fly tying vice because I, I just like it. Um, but some of the features that you, you are really looking for is, well, it needs to hold the fly and it needs, or the hook that you're going to use. And then two, um, depending on the hook that you're using, uh, it needs to cover that range of variety. If, if you're going to be fishing from little tiny size 22 all the way up to these huge um, salt water hooks. Um, it's going to be a little bit tough. You may need to find something that has some interchangeable jaws that can handle the smaller versus the larger range um, hooks. Uh, other than that, uh, it's it's really going to be up to you on your price range. And I got some suggestions here, so let me let me run this video real quick and see if it answers that question. some fly fishing things and basically it's uh, answering the mail concerning a follow-on question to um, a fly fishing fly rod reel question concerning best uh, uh, fly fishing uh, rod uh, reel combo to get started with and we posted that way back when I think we'll we'll put a link in the video but uh, what what happened then is is the next questions that we started getting was um, how do I get started fly tying and um, well We've been mulling this one over uh, for several weeks now uh, because, well, what we find is, is you get a lot of advice from different folks uh, who've been fly tying and fly fishing and all that, and next thing you know, uh, everyone's suggesting the great, latest and greatest fly tying gear, uh, fly tying vices, etc. And so uh, we're taking the average Joe approach. Uh, I want to just uh, get started and fly uh, tying. Well, um, we'll keep it simple. First thing is, is how to get started in fly tying? Well, get started fly fishing. Uh, what happens then is, is you'll go fly fishing. You'll be using various fishing flies and you're purchasing them. Next thing you know, you're going to get the urge to, well, I'd rather maybe tie them myself for various reasons. Um, pleasure of tying in your own fly and crafting it. And the next thing you know, you're catching uh, a, 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 or fooling a fish out in the wild. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, in other cases, it may be uh, um, a pattern that's not available in your area, so you want to learn how to tie that one. Uh, or it could be <coughs> and just cheaper to tie your own flies. Um, or, or it's more or it's starting to become more expensive, I guess, when it comes to tying more flies. 
uh, or purchasing flies at the uh, local uh, fly shop or, or whatnot. And so uh, there's a lot of things that will drive you to, to fly tying, but the first thing is, is fly fishing. You're, you're, you're out there fishing with flies. And what happens then is, is you're going to find that there's a particular fishing fly that you use often that uh, catches a lot more of the fish that you uh, are fishing for and <clears throat> you find that you purchase it more often and so uh, our, our first suggestion then is uh, get started fly fishing get interested and find out what fishing fly is it that is uh, working for you and then learn that pattern if you want to get started in fly tying it doesn't mean you need to go out and buy the latest and greatest fly tying gear fly butt fishing vice etc uh, you could start out something simple as some basic tie fly tying material there's just like different links in, in the uh, on the internet telling you what you should get uh, you know be it fly tying thread vices etc <coughs> <coughs> but if you really just want to start out simple um, and, and economically because you don't have a lot to spend um, what we suggest is picking that one fishing fly that you're going to use often um, hopefully it's a pattern that's fairly easy to tie maybe it's a woolly bugger um, maybe it's a, a topwater fly something that you you are using and uh, at that point learn that pattern get the material for it and then from a tying setup you can go as you know what's with everything in your budget um, uh, in the past uh, on, as needed if I was out on the road uh, I'd get my own um, forceps and I'd use that as a fly tying vice other places I've used um, those well, in fact let me grab it I've used one of these where uh, you have this uh, alligator clip basically and you put your hook there and you tie so whatever you have on hand is really where you can start off with when it comes to a fly tying vise and so uh, the other stuff you'll need you need some tying thread and whatnot uh, the hooks but uh, go with that pattern get the material for it and then get proficient in tying it and then what will end up happening is is you'll you'll get proficient in tying the fly you'll have more of those fishing flies you'll be more likely to fish it more aggressively a particular fishing fly because you know you can tie more it's really available to you versus having to wait uh, for the store to open or having to order it online uh, because you have to purchase it and versus tie it yourself and then after that uh, you'll find that um, your proficiency in tying that fly will expand to other patterns uh, additionally uh, if if you do have more to spend then you can start uh, spending more money on on uh, the other fly tying gear but you'll have your basics which you can look online I think it's like have your force or you know, let's go and do it real quick for a bobbin uh, for your fly tying thread good pair of scissors we suggest the um, a whip finish knot uh, or whip finish knot tire um, but you don't have to you could do it also by hand um, for, uh, you don't have to have it but we like it because uh, it's for threading your bobbin so bobbin threader okay but at a minimum you definitely need one of these so bobbin scissors <coughs> sometimes you need hackle pliers depending on if you're going to be tying hackle and then your fly tying vise. But bottom line, at the bare necessity for some of your patterns, and I've tied them before, is just need a means to hold the thread, another means to um, hold the hook, and then scissors to cut your thread. And after that, um, everything else kind of falls in place. Other things that you have, you can get the fancy stuff. But we use a lot of crazy glue, super glue for our gluing. And then we do have other kind of UV glue, but ones for quick ones are these five second fix UV glue. Comes with this light, you get it for like five bucks at CVS. We do have a, a more fancier version, but we tend not to use this one as much because the other one just a lot quicker to, to use. Um, get your basic material, uh, but the key is not to spend a lot of money initially, even if you do have a lot of funds to pay for. 
what ends up happening is, is if you spend a lot of money up front and then it turns out later you don't even want to tie anymore or you don't uh, have the time to tie, uh, then you've just wasted your money. Um, what we did was, um, from a progression in fly tying vices, uh, the first one we bought was an old cheap way back when Bass Pro Shops $9 kit came with a bunch of other material <coughs> but was this very cheap uh, vise that you clamped onto a table um, and very, it's like pressed sheet metal bent uh, and then it had a clamp that uh, clamped onto the table and then it was a, and then the vise um, we got rid of it years ago for whatever reason kinda wish I still had it because that would be a good one just to have um, but here, we'll show you some fly tying vices, how our progression went throughout the years. Okay, so after we uh, had that $9 uh, kit one, uh, pressed sheet metal and uh, vice, um, we moved on to this one, which came to a, I think this one came out to like 15 bucks or so back then. Made in India. <coughs> It's clamped onto a table, and <laughs> you can adjust it. Has various, uh, you know, it's got a deal here. Didn't spend much at all, under 20 bucks. I think it was 15 bucks is what we paid for this thing. I think maybe you can get them for about the same price, anyways. It's made in India. It's not nothing fancy. It's got some heft to it, but this did a lot for us for many years. Um, and the only reason why we got another one was because we had a gift card and. I uh, wanted to try one of these rotary vices, so let's go grab that one. Okay, so this one, actually this one's clamped also. Uh, but we ended up taking it off and buying a separate pedestal for it. And this one actually um, came in at an angle, but we straightened it out and kind of found out that you could rotate it. And it was our pseudo rotary one. I think we paid 29 bucks for this one. Um, another 10 15 bucks I think for the pedestal it's pretty heavy and we use this for many many years um, added this little arm and all that uh, and then we retired it and picked up one of these peak tying vices um, this is the one that we last purchased and about maybe five ten years ago and we don't plan on buying anymore we're good with this one it's heavy it's got a pedestal and we've been very happy with this one. Uh, this one we probably paid about 30 bucks at the uh, $10, $15 pedestal. So uh, this one we paid about 150. Uh, now the one we just showed before this one, um, we mainly use that one for when we're in a hurry and we're tying different jigs and whatnot, we'll just leave that aside. This one, we ended up getting one of these tube tying, uh, fly tube whatever kits where it's an attachment right here. It's got an attachment and you actually just clamp it into the vise itself. And this kind of pretty much sit, sits aside until we're ready to use it for whatever reason for those tube flies. People love Subaru just because right, we'll it's it second much more than just a call. Goes and then I'll skip it. All right, and again, thanks for joining today. Uh, we're at the uh, fly tying vice question. I'm pretty happy with this baby. It's got a little arm. It's got a heavy pedestal. Um, didn't plan on buying any one after this one. Um, you can probably buy some other ones, better ones, whatnot, but. It does what we were looking for. In fact, if we had bought that one first, we probably wouldn't have gotten the other ones. But then we probably wouldn't have gotten the fly tying either because there was a good time period where we didn't tie our own flies. We got the initial fly tying vise for like nine bucks and about five, ten years passed by before we got the next fly tying vise and in between there tied very minimally. Um, only as needed, meaning I needed another popper fly is basically what I did, or I was making some jigs uh, for saltwater fishing. Uh, and shifted over to the, um, the next one after that, which is uh, this one. And we kept this one for many years as well, about another five, 10 years. And we actually did a lot of tying on this one. Um, and then we ended up moving on to 
the pedal space one that we use for making those tube flies now. And and the only reason why we moved from that uh, tube fly one to the peak uh, tying vise was one day we were at um, I think it was at uh, the Bass Pro Shops over there um, Garland over there by Lake Ray Hubbard uh, just over the what is it Highway 30 and whatnot we were over there one day getting some material and uh, uh, in the fishing shop fly fishing shop that's what they were using for demoing some of the fly tying and when we played around with it we're like this this is a pretty good vice so uh, we stuck with it and um, kind of put some money aside uh, good year or two before we decided to finally purchase it when we saw it that it wasn't going to go any lower than the 150 that we had been paying for I think we watched it for a good two, one to two years and never saw the price really change so ended up purchasing it once um, we had enough uh, dollars saved on the side to go pick it up and ever since then never even worried about getting another fly tying vice so how to get started in fly tying one start fly fishing two since you started fly fishing, you'll find that there's a certain fishing fly that you use often. Learn to tie that fishing fly. Um, for whatever reason, is it because you want to save some money? Is it because you want the pleasure of catching a fish for something that you caught or made uh, a fishing fly that you made and you crafted? And now you get the extra pleasure of fooling a fish with your craftsmanship. Uh, or is it just another hobby that you want to try and it's, um, you, know, you find some pleasure in that? Well, whatever the reason. Um, have that reason, have that passion, and you'll find that um, you'll stick with it. Um, it may have some gaps in time uh, between when you first started to when you pick it up again, uh, but that's the way it is. Uh, I guess our big lesson learned is don't ever get rid of anything that you bought related to fly tying, because eventually when you do come back to it, um, you're going to wish you had it. And I, in fact, right now I'm wishing I had that little $9 one from way back when. We sold it at a garage sale one day, on a whim too. Uh, but I <coughs> still would like that. I probably would put it off to the side with the other ones, and use that when I'm making some other kind of fly uh, or some other pattern. So, all right. So, uh, let's go ahead and recap basic tools, and then close it out. All right. Bare minimum. Have a. Alrighty. Alrighty. I, I, I hope that, that was helpful. helpful. Um, um, let's see. Peak is now 210. Oh, oh man, it went, went up. up. Man, you say 150 for close to like five, five years. years. Three, 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 five, five years. years. Uh, it's a great, great vice. vice. Um, I, like I like it. Um, folks will suggest other, other vices and whatnot. whatnot. I just, I just, it's, it's the, the one, one I use and I don't have any urge to get any other ones. And, and like, like I was saying, saying in that video, video the, the key to fishing flies, flies is <coughs> learn, learn to tie the one, one that, that you use the most. Because, because what will happen, happen then is, is the one you use the most is probably the one that you're going to lose, lose the, most. the most. But you're going to, because, because you tie them, them yourself, yourself, you're more, more likely, likely to... to Fish, fish more aggressively. So, so over the years, years when, I when I first started, started fishing, fishing uh, and, and all I had, I had were, I think it was like a, a one, or one or two flies, flies the, the, the Beps Brim Getter, and then, and then, then some, some cheesy one, one that, that came, came in a, in a in kit. kit. Uh, the, 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 um, um uh, I think the, oh, it's, oh, it's echoing? echoing? Okay. okay, I know, I know what, it what it is. How about now? Okay, all right. Whew, sorry. Um, the the key to getting started uh, in the case of the fishing flies, one is like the article was saying. There's four basic fishing flies to learn to tie. I think those are the same four basic fishing flies to um, start with when you're fishing a particular area. So again, to reiterate, the woolly bugger. The elk hair caddis, the gold rib hairs your nymph, and then that zebra midge, freshwater wise. Um, and then from a fly tying standpoint, uh, once you figure out this is your fly that you, you tend to use the most, 
you'll tend to fish more aggressively because instead of having to pay a premium for a replacement when you go fishing, instead you're going to be able to tie your own and you'll be able to have them. Um, when I was able to start tying, uh, you know, woolly buggers and and the near deer that I use, I I don't even sweat it when I when I lose a, a fly anymore. Um, instead, I I tend to uh, uh, be more aggressive in targeting where I believe that particular fish or trout in this case is is lingering um, or lurking. Uh, okay, I break off. I'll just tie on another one. I got ten more in um, uh, in my fly box. Uh, let's see. In the case of uh, fly tying vices and getting started, that question gets asked a lot, and I, I get I get I get frustrated sometimes because I see some people just getting inundated with you, you need to get this fly tying vice you need this one you need that one uh if if i had that advice i probably never would have bought one uh but instead i had 10 bucks enough to go order one from bass pro shops and i started with a little tying kit from way back when i learned how to tie a popper i learned how to tie a variation of the bets brim getter and over the years uh i kind of slacked off uh, fly fishing and was mainly using it to tie jigs uh and then later on, I picked it up again, and I went to four vices before I settled on the one that I use now, and I'm happy with it. Uh, I think it's, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's paid for itself over the years because of the amount of uh, flies that I've lost, uh, but I think it's well worth it because, um, yeah, that stuff gets expensive after a while. Um, the other thing is... When it comes to fishing flies in general, uh, Google is your friend. I know some folks may not like Google, uh, but uh, yeah, Google is your friend. Go on there and search. Do some quick search terms on your particular area and, and at least get started. I never would have found out about that article about Oklahoma, um, six fishing flies in Oklahoma to use, uh, to have in your back pocket, basically. Uh, unless I was online uh, and, and was Googling at the time. The other thing is, is when it comes to other ways, uh, I was on the Texas Fishing Forum. They used to have a thread for the Denison Dam uh, tail race that we have here. And yours truly being the fishing addict that I am, I had never fished uh, Denison Dam. And before I did for the first time, uh, they had a thread that was, it was pages long, um, and I just went through that whole thread and cut out or copy and pasted every single tip that someone suggested on use this particular lure, use this particular fly, or use this particular method, and I put those all aside, put it in my little notes thing on Notepad, and then from there, I put a little wish list or, or purchase list uh, of <coughs> everything that was suggested. <coughs> and then I ran over to Academy and I think it was Walmart as well as uh, uh, one of the other uh, sport, sporting goods places. And I just started picking up a bunch of uh, lures and whatnot. And then I hit the dam for the first time with my son. And it was a little brutal at first. Uh, but we ended up catching some stripers, and it was on one of the lures uh, that was suggested. And in fact, uh, Murphy's Law came in, and we got, you know, we, we learned that that one lure that was uh, what they were hitting on was uh, was what uh, worked. Let's see, Loyalist 1407, sorry. Oh, no problem. Uh, I, I, it's a great question. Uh, Really, really love going over there. Is there any particular question that you that you want answered, possibly? Um, just to reiterate or summarize what we talked about so far, um, there was a article that we looked up using Google search uh, right here. Types of fishing types of fishing flies. Right there, and then we skipped the first. Um, uh, entry and went to this one types of fishing flies your beginner's guide and in there it's the hiking and fishing.com blog 
took us to this article. And in here had some really good insight on the different fish and flies uh, to use and those types, giving a general category of a wet fly versus a dry fly, and then breaking it down between wet fly and dry fly and what those variations are, as well as some uh, like exceptions or variations of each. And what was really nice about this is, let me scroll down to it if I can get to it real quick here, major categories. What was really nice is right here. I like this piece where he's talking about uh, the different uh, stages that these fish and flies are mimicking. So in the case of a midge, you've got a larval, a merger, and an adult phase. And in this case right here, the larval stage, this particular fish and fly, a wet fly, is mimicking this. And it's just a simple red thread, looks like body, um, streamer hook it looks like, and it's to mimic this shape of a larval um, midge. And then in the case of the emerger, you can see how it's about ready to emerge. It's just under the surface, and here it's got a CDC, um, look like feathers and a little thin body section to again mimic this body section here and then the thorax piece and it's able to float in the upper part of the water column and then finally you've got the dry fly right here where it's going to sit on the surface and it's 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 the adult pat um stage of that particular midge and in there it talks of the mayfly that was that was and giving that same description in case adding the spinner piece where the, the fly or the, the insect has died now. In the case of the caddis, uh, what I liked about the caddis piece was right here. This right here, I've, I've been in the river before, local rivers and whatnot, and taking my little scene and seeing what's showing. And sure enough, I've seen this show up. And I mainly go, oh, okay, I, I need this color. And then I find the fly in my fly box that looks similar to that. Um, but now I got a good idea that, hey, I'm going to go straight to one of these um, midge patterns uh, similar to this one right here. All right. Uh, it also talks of the stone fly. And in this case, terrestrials. With, of the terrestrials, the ant, the grasshopper, the beetle, the deer fly moth and the dragon fly I've used. I haven't used the cicada or the salmon fly locally, but it seems to work pretty good. Uh, why don't Americans fish intermediate lines? It always seems to be floating. I'm not sure about the intermediate lines. I tend to, um, depending on where I'm fishing, uh, I'm just one American, uh, but where I fish for uh, the local lakes, the fish tend to be in the upper part of the water column as well as the rivers. Uh, in some of the larger lakes, uh, like in Lake Texoma, it's one of our larger ones up the up the border here. Um, most times when I'm fishing, fly fishing uh, in the main body of the lake, I'm mainly fishing again the upper water column. If they're down deep, um, I'm skipping the fly fishing and I'm going straight over to uh, 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 trolling and using some some uh, tandem rig bucktail jigs and whatnot or some of the uh, other methods that we use here um, so maybe it's just uh, maybe the intermediate line is being used by by those folks in uh, in America that are fishing where the, the fish are deeper I do keep um, several sinking tips available because I, I do have a several switch rods that uh, I like to use uh, but when I'm using those sinking tips, typically using them when there's faster water and then I need the the line to sink quicker to get it down to the money zone where the fish are, are um, uh, lurking. Uh, but other than that, where I'm fishing, I, I don't need uh, the, the fly line to sink. And so I tend to, to use a floating line more often than not. Did that answer your question? All right. Um, Let's see, the other thing is <clears throat> there's an article that was also referenced in the first article that was good about wet flies versus dry flies. That was another good one. And what I liked here again was uh, it's going into detail. What is a fly? What is a wet fly? What is a dry fly? The materials that's being used and what it's mimicking. Uh, so that, that was a uh, one that I would keep in my back pocket if I wanted to know, hey, what, what in particular do I need to know about some fishing flies? So uh, we did that. And then um, 
Let's see, from there, I shifted over to just describing some uh, uh, fishing flies that I use locally. Uh, there's a playlist that I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the in the comments and description of this video that um, that explains more of that. Let's see. And then, let's see, I think the last piece was I talked about uh, fly tying vices. Yeah, fly tying vices, where uh, how I got started in fly tying. And the, the main takeaway from that is uh, if you want to get started in fly tying, you don't have to spend a lot of money up front. And if you are um, uh, wanting to, to learn to tie, the first thing is, is uh, fly fish. Get started fly fishing. Second thing is, after a while, you're going to find out that this is a particular fishing fly that you tend to use for the particular species that you're fishing for. So that's your key to learn to tie that fly because then you'll uh, be able to learn to tie that fly, make more of those flies, and you'll tend to fish it more aggressively uh, instead of kind of babying it so you don't want to lose that particular fly because it may be costly. So because you can tie more of them yourself, you're not too worried about it. Um, that was the main takeaway there, as well as um, you know, buy a vice that you can afford. As long as it can hold the hook in place, you should be good to go. Eventually, uh, you will move up to um, a more expensive version of a fly tying vice. Um, but as long as it holds the hook uh, tightly, you should be good to go. Uh, and then uh, uh, just <clears throat> keep in your back pocket that most likely... Uh, especially with the, the younger folks when you're first starting out and you, you get really into fly fishing, but then other commitments happen. Work, um, family, you have kids and whatnot. Next thing you know, uh, you're not fishing as much as you'd like. And so things kind of get put away and put on hold, but then things pick up back again. So the other suggestion then is, is if you do buy any fly tying or fishing stuff, don't get rid of it. Because most likely you're going to come back to it again. All right. Um, and that was that was pretty much it. Uh, hope this was helpful. Uh, I do plan on um, doing some more of these. Um, still learning this uh, streaming piece and getting the handle on this software. Um, some some just updates in general. Uh, I do plan on uh, going fishing. I was going to be fishing today. Uh, but then I learned that we've got a, a front that's going to be hitting us that may get a little bit chilly. And I think I'm going to wait on that because I don't feel like tent camping uh, overnight. Um, yeah, I don't feel like tent camping right now. <laughs> it's a little chilly. It's going to be a little chilly. But uh, I am going to try either hitting Saturday or Sunday. Just do a day trip, make a run up to the Blue River and see if we can get some of those bruiser trout because... Uh, I did see on Facebook, as well as some of the um, results of the uh, Veterans Day Trout Derby, and there were some really nice trout that were caught. Um, and so I, I got a feeling that there may be some nice ones still out there lurking in the river. All right. uh, and then other than that, uh, I do have some other videos that I've got in the works. But the main thing is, is uh, at this time of year... Uh, we as a team, and right now I'm the only one in the team, everyone else is, well, they moved on to other things, uh, but I still kind of represent, uh, what we're, what I try doing is uh, hit the Blue River, because it is being stocked weekly for the next few months, up until March next year, and then soon in the next week to two weeks, our local our local uh, ponds uh, will be getting stocked here. Uh, so it's the Texas Parks and Wildlife trout stocking season. I've got the schedule posted, the version I have, but I do suggest that you go check online. Make sure you, you see what the latest and greatest schedule is. There are some particular ones that I tend to, to focus on because they're, they're nearby as well as I do um, do well at those locations. Um, and then other than that, uh, once, once that, part of the season tails down i'll shift back over to the warm water season again and um uh, shift over to uh be at fishing uh or the tail race up at denison or our local lake and do some of that kayak fishing all righty all right uh i'll get this one uh wrapped up 
and uh, it should be available uh, for those that weren't able to see all of it and I hope it was helpful and again this is one of these let's talk fishing my broadcasts from an average Joe standpoint and from the field team yours truly Glenn welcome or uh, not welcome but uh, good luck and good fishing we'll go ahead and close out things thanks again for joining take care